Good morning and welcome to Carmel Presbyterian Church Online. I'm so glad you've joined us this morning and if you're tuning in on Sunday morning, happy Mother's Day. If you are new to our CPC family, make sure you're connected with what's going on throughout the week by subscribing to our CPC Weekly. Go to the bottom of the front page of our website and enter your email address to make sure you're receiving that each week. If this is your church home, we love seeing you engage throughout the week, whether it's small groups or Bible studies or commenting and sharing our social media online. If you missed Wednesday's Q&A with Kathy Gray on mental health and well-being, catch the replay on our Facebook page or on our YouTube channel and feel free to share the video with family and friends. We have our second Sunday afternoon organ concert at 3 p.m. today with Unha on Facebook Live. Two guests will join her and present music for Mother's Day. And this Tuesday evening at 6 p.m., we have the opportunity to worship together, led by Ben Bransford and Brittany Pallone. Join us on Facebook Live. And as always, if you can't tune in right at 6 p.m., you can always catch the replay later. The longer we are in shelter in place, our prayer requests and our praises may multiply or change in ways we don't expect. So I invite you to email your prayer request to prayer at carmelprez.org so that we can walk with you in prayer this week. And lastly, thank you for your continued generosity, which fuels the ministry here at CPC and our missionaries around the world and our deacons right here at home helping those in need. Thank you. So as we begin our worship service this morning, we ask God to tune our hearts to sing His praise, to meditate on His word, and for the Holy Spirit to pray in our weakness. Would you receive his invitation to come this morning? And Jesus said, come. To all mothers and children, come. To the motherless and childless, he said, come. To all who long to be mothered, he said, come. Come unto me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Today is a day of honor for moms. For every mother in every stage of life, today is a day of honor. We honor moms of infants and little ones. May God bless you with patience, kindness, and perseverance. And may you believe that your never-ending job will help bring true life to the generations that follow. We honor moms of teenagers. May God give you grace upon grace. And may you travel this uncertain journey together with them as they transition from child to adult. We honor women who are trying to have children, but who are not yet able. It took courage and resolve to come to church today. May God gently remind you that He has not forgotten you. And may you become newly inspired to keep your eyes fixed on the light of His gaze. We honor grandmothers today. May God give you the grace to see the good that you provided to your own children and may you help inspire your grandkids to follow Jesus with every step they take. And finally, we honor moms who have lost children prematurely. May God be your strength and comfort on a day like today, and may you rise stronger than ever to be a blessing to others. For those we mentioned, and for the many unidentified moms that we didn't, God has always used a mother's love and strength to make known his own love and strength. In your best moments and in your imperfections, the glory of God is shining through you. Happy Mother's Day. Today is the day we set aside to honor our moms. 
for some, that is a time to reflect with joy and just remembering mom. For others, maybe it brings some feelings of sadness or just a, a legacy that your mom left. Will you join me in prayer right now? Father God, we worship you this morning. We are in awe of you as creator. You not only set the stars in place creating our world, you also design families, fathers and mothers, sisters and brothers. As we pause and reflect on each of our families, there is such a variety. Thank you that you are intimately aware of everything that has gone on in our lives and what we are experiencing right this minute. Lord Jesus, remind us often throughout the year, you are indeed Emmanuel, God with us. Regardless of what the story of our lives or our families has been, when we seek you and accept your gift of salvation, Lord Jesus, you set us in your forever family. And for many of us, that family is found at our church, Carmel Presbyterian. As we enter into a new study in the book of Psalms today, we will often be reminded that you are a merciful, loving, and gracious Father. I know that in every situation we find ourselves in, whether blessings or heartache, Lord Jesus, you are with us in the midst of it. You understand our fears and all the anxiety we experienced in these crazy times. If we're tempted to forget your love and your grace, remind us that we all belong to you. As Pastor Tim comes to speak to us, may the words he has prepared fill us with hope. Father, it is always our privilege to pray for those we support who serve you on our behalf around the world in places like Lebanon, Uganda, India. I pray that even today, wherever they are and whatever their immediate need may be, will you meet their needs in such a way that their faith and confidence in you is proven to be strengthened. We now join our voices as your family in the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now, wherever you are, whoever you're with, Will you join your voices as we worship our Savior right now?
Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and all that he does he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. Good morning. You know, as we journey through the Psalms together today, we will discover this pathway through God's Word that will lead us through this season. You know, each of us bring different emotions today. You can come as you are. You can come today with, with praise on your lips. You can come today with grief on your heart. The Lord understands. This is this journey through the Psalms that we will bring all of our emotions together. You know, the entirety of the Psalms were the scriptures that Jesus read. There were the songs that Jesus sung. There were the prayers that Jesus prayed. How much more do we need to learn these Psalms for our own lives? This was Jesus' own songbook. It was his thinking. It was the way it shaped his life, these very Psalms. And we get to join in to let this book shape us. We can pray that these become our songs too. So would you join me in a prayer? Lord Jesus, we want to learn your songbook. We want to learn your prayer book. That we would be thinking your thoughts. That the things on your heart would become on our hearts. That we would live the ways that you want to shape us. So Lord, help us to delight in you this morning. And as we do that, may the roots of our souls go down deeply and help us to grow in you, that we might be a blessing. Open our eyes and our hearts and our ears to your word this morning. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. You know, the longest book in the Bible, the Psalms, it would take you about four to five hours to read in one sitting. So, well, don't worry, we're not going to take that long today. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, we do believe that God is going to press into us a great amount of wisdom in this short time together. Now, the Psalms were written in Hebrew and cover about 800 years of Israel's history. Now, ancient Israelites, they read and they sang these songs, this divinely inspired hymn book that were really divided into five separate sections. So early Christians as well, they used the Psalms in their worship. We know that from Colossians 3.16, they were singing Psalms. In fact, Protestant reformer Martin Luther, he elevated the Psalms by naming them the Little Bible. By studying and praying and living the Psalms together, that we're going to learn to sing the praise to God the way that Jesus was doing it. We're going to offer up our real praise to God while we offer up our real pain to God. The Psalms teach us to do that. And what we're going to do is learn how God wants us to stay rooted in hopefulness and rooted in reality. Take a look at Psalm 1, 1 with me. It says, blessed is the man. A simple definition for the Hebrew word, it's esher. It can be blessed or happy. So God wants us to experience happiness in this life. And he gives us clarity about how to achieve it, how to attain it in him. You know, if you do a Google search for the word blessed, you're going to get a lot of different responses. You're going to see different Christian authors talk about the blessed life. But you're also going to see a hedge fund manager who says, if you invest with him, you'll make a lot of money. Hashtag blessed. You might come across an Elton John song from 1995 called blessed. Or you might see a photo of a health food guru who only eats organic vegetables and drinks filtered water and says her life is blessed. See, all of these are different messages telling you about how to achieve the blessed life. And yet, what does the Bible say? So we take a look 
at Psalm 1-1 again. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. See, the psalmist says the happy person is the one who avoids the wicked, the sinners, the scoffers. Well, these are really just three different ways to describe someone who refuses to follow the way of God. See, wrong counsel will tell you that you need control, you need certainty in order to be happy, and right now none of us have any of that. See, even the American dream, as we grew up knowing it, it could lead you astray. Well, what is that? What have we heard our whole life growing up? Well, you need to go to school to get good grades and get good grades so you can go get into a good university. And then you're going to choose a good major so you can get a good job, right? So you can make lots of money, so you can buy stuff, so you can be happy. That's the American dream. God's word says, do not sit in the seat of scoffers. Do not stand in the way of sinners. Do not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Don't listen to those false ways. Listen to the true way of the Lord. It tells you there's a whole nother way. Because the popular thought is that the blessed life, it means I could get that job, then I'll be blessed. Or if, if that person would only call me back, and consider going on a date with me, then I'll be blessed. Or uh, if she would only say she was sorry, if she would apologize, then I would be blessed. Or if the 1% would finally pay their fair share. Or if the 99% would finally stop complaining. If only, if only, if only, then I'll be happy. Then I'll be blessed. Psalm 1 says, there's a different way. And this different way is seeing that the blessed life is found only in God. See, Psalm 1 is a psalm introducing a way of life that goes against the grain. It puts God first and me second. The psalms remind us that the blessed life is available to us right now. In these circumstances, God says, I will bless you. And it's found in Him. So amidst a world that says you must work hard to attain happiness, God says you can have it right now. The blessed life life. Take a look at verse 2. It says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. See, a major theme of the Psalms is for the godly to know and to live the law of God or the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. The blessed person makes knowing and living God's word the center of their life. See, the psalmist knows that we can't please God with dead religion, that the past to closeness with God is to delight in God. And so when Jesus asked which of the religious laws were most important to follow him, when he was asked that, you know what he said? The most important commandment is, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. He said, this is the great and first commandment, Matthew 22. And so Jesus says, God's greatest desire is that you delight in him. That's what it means to follow him. And then remind you that Jesus says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and the life. And we learned a couple weeks ago that that was another way of saying, of Jesus saying, I am the Torah. I am the law. I am the law of God. Memorize me, follow me, lean into me. And so for the Christian reading Psalm 1, we know that God wants us to delight not only in the scriptures, but in Jesus himself is what he's saying. In him, in his word, in his ways. Delighting in him, the Lord of your life every day. That is what he wants for us. You know, there's an old story, a man named Joseph Flax. He was a Christian teacher who had an opportunity to address a gathering of Arabs and Jews many years ago. And he decided to address them by talking about Psalm 1, the very one we're studying today. He wanted to point to Christ. He read Psalm 1 to this unique audience. And then he asked the question, who is this blessed man of whom the psalmist speaks? And knowing that he wanted him to point to Jesus, he said, this man in Psalm 1 looks like an absolutely sinless man. And so nobody spoke. And so Flax said, well, maybe was he our great father Abraham? And one old man raised his hand and said, no, it cannot be Abraham. He denied his wife and told a lie about her. Well, then how about the lawgiver Moses? 
No, someone said, it cannot be Moses. He killed a man and he lost his temper by the waters of Meribah. And so then Flack suggested, well, maybe David, but they eliminated David as well. And there was silence for a long while. Then an elderly Jewish man stood up. He said, my brothers, I have a little book here. It's called the New Testament. I've been reading it. And if I could believe this book, if I could be sure it was true, then I would say that the man of the first Psalm was Jesus of Nazareth. Friends, that old Jewish man was right. You see, whatever makes you feel alive is what you delight in. And it will ultimately be what you serve. If God is not your delight, then you will certainly find something else to delight in, whether it be drink or security or power or comfort, you name it. So let me ask you, what destructive things have you delighted in that now you can see were empty pursuits? How have you been distracted by false ways that looked like truth, but now you realize, no, it's only found in Jesus You see, but whatever we delight in, we will ultimately serve. Now, when I delight in something, I tend to talk about it. Back in Los Angeles, we had this one ice cream store down the street from us. It had the freshest ingredients, it had the most creative flavors. It was delicious and creamy and wonderful. Anytime someone visited us, we always said, you have to go to that ice cream store. You have to go there. Now, think about it. You naturally praise what you enjoy. You naturally talk about the things that you enjoy. Your grandchildren, a restaurant, a beautiful sunset. You can't stop talking about it. It's easy to talk about things we enjoy. And so God is saying, that's what I want in my relationship with you, my child. I want you to delight in me so much. It's the most natural thing to soak in my love. It's the most natural thing to talk about me is what God wants from us. Happy people delight in the Lord. They enjoy him. In Psalm 1 verse 2, it says this, And on his law he meditates day and night. You see, happy people delight on God's law and they meditate it on it all day, all night. Literally the Hebrew word for meditate is the sense of chewing on it. Chewing on it. See, the godly person thinks on God's truth, not on the world's lies. And so let me ask you, what thoughts do you chew on? If I ask what the best moment of your life has been, most of you would take some time to figure it out. But I want you to think about this. If I ask you what your worst moment has been, most of you would say, I know it. Oh, that's easy. So I want to ask you, why do the worst moments seem so easy to recall and why are the best moments sometimes harder to recall. You know, after a sermon, I'm, I might get several compliments. Maybe a dozen or so people will say, nice job, Pastor Tim. That was great. The Lord spoke to me. And then sometimes I get that one criticism. Now, I want you to think about, what do you think I think about the most? The 20 nice things people said or the one criticism? I don't know if your brain works like mine. I often think about the one criticism. Do you struggle like me to focus on the negative? Is that your struggle like mine? When you're all by yourself, what do the voices say in your head? What are the, the, the narratives that are playing in your mind? What thoughts do you chew on? See, whatever you chew on, whatever you meditate on, they shape you. When you make a mistake, are you able to admit it and move on or do you beat yourself up? You're chewing on it, right? Do you ever find yourself thinking, Oh, I'm such an idiot. Don't chew on that. Your self-talk creates a narrative that you default to because it's what you chew on. It's what you meditate on. You see, but I need to chew on the reality of God's love so that it dwells deep within me and overflows to others. Why do I chew on the thing that undermines my identity as the one who is deeply loved by Christ regardless of my performance. See, that's how God looks at me. That's how God looks at you. See, Psalm 1 tells us to meditate on his word instead of meditating on all the voices that are saying, you're not good enough. Give up. You're not worthy of love. Don't listen to those voices. Those voices are trying to control your life. 
God says, don't chew on it. Meditate on God's truth instead. I love how the psalmist continues. He says in verse 3, He is like a tree planted by the streams of water. You see, the godly man and woman have a secret. They have roots that go down deep into the truth of God's love. You see, a healthy tree has deep roots. Or else when the winds come and the rains come, the, the weight of the stress will topple the tree. And you need deep roots as well. Deep roots in Jesus to help you withstand the storms of the season. And if you let destructive thoughts get the best of you, it means your roots actually might be thirsty. So you need to stay hydrated with the Spirit. You won't be soaking up bad things if you've been drinking from the true source. And your roots will go deep to sustain you in the storm. I don't know if you've ever wondered, where do tumbleweeds come from? I had to look it up. Well, in Texas, at least, these tumbleweed, they start off as plants and they grow as thick green bushes. And when the rain stops, though, the roots actually cannot find enough water to sustain them. And they, ultimately, they wither and then they fall over. And eventually, those shallow roots are no longer to even keep them anchored to the ground. And they literally dry up and they blow away. Now, in contrast, in this part of Texas, you have mesquite trees. And they can grow in the same area, but they do just the opposite. Even after a prolonged drought, if you cut it down, it grows right back. They even say you can dig down 10 feet. You can burn down the stump. And you know what will happen? Another tree will grow. You know why? It has deep, deep roots. See, the difference between tumbleweeds and mesquite trees are the deep roots. So I want you to soak in the fact that the God of the universe has his eyes on you. Drink in deeply the love of the Father revealed in the Son by the power of the Spirit. You will naturally praise that which you enjoy. So delight yourself in him. Let your roots go down deep. Verse 4 says, that the wicked will not stand. They are not so. They are like the chaff that the wind drives away. And you see, and the psalmist goes on and says that, that this tree, it yields its fruit in the right season. And its leaf does not wither. And in all that he does, he will prosper. You see, the godly have deep roots. It's connected to a constant source, which means they're going to be fruitful. See, even their leaves look healthy. Even their leaves will be green. That These righteous have these deep roots. Now, I want you to notice that these righteous, the Bible doesn't say they're self-righteous. See, no one loves the arrogant know-it-all person, right? The godly, instead, are people on the right path. They're happy in the Lord and happy in life. I don't know if you know the story of Coach John Wooden. He was known as the Wizard of Westwood. But anyone close to him knew him simply as Coach. You see, he let the fruit of his life preach for him. He said this, I always had a Bible on my desk, and I intentionally led by example based on Christ's teaching. I know you can't please everyone. I've only wanted to please God. You see, Jesus said the greatest commandment is to love God. But he also said to love your neighbor as yourself. See, we are to, to delight in God and show his love. Because you see, when you're rooted in Jesus as your source, your fruit will show. See, it's not our job to convert anyone. It's our job to stay rooted. Jesus says, I am the vine. You are the branches. Remain in me and I will remain in you. Apart from me, you can do nothing. I don't know if you know the saying that goes like this. Don't let people pull you into their storm. Instead, pull them into your peace. When you are rooted in Christ, when you delight and meditate on him and his word, you have an irresistible steadiness that captures the attention of those looking for real life. Stay rooted in Christ. I don't know if you've heard about the top five regrets of the dying, according to a palliative nurse. She said this, she noticed this, the top five regrets. Number one, I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. Number two, 
I wish I hadn't spent so much time at work. Three, I wish I'd had the courage to express my feelings. Number four, I wish I'd stayed in touch with my friends. And lastly, number five, I wish that I had let myself be happier. See, Psalm 1 is about living life with no regrets. It's a life so rooted in the Word of God and the person of Jesus Christ that we cease trying to prove ourselves to others and instead live out of the overflow of God's sustaining love. You see, it's a life that is aware that we cannot allow ourselves to be defined by what we do or what we have or what people say about us. It's a life that embraces the reality that we are wired by God for community, not isolation, and that we were meant to bless others. See, Psalm 1 is all about the happy life, the blessed life, because we drink from the well of God's holy word and we produce fruit for others to enjoy. See, as our roots go deeper, we grow into a tree that provides shade for others to find rest. Could someone say that about you? That some fruit from your life has given them some kind of sweetness? That the growth from the tree that God is growing in you from those deep roots have given them shade? Oh, God wants to use you as a great and beautiful tree to bless someone else. I want to invite you this week into a spiritual practice that's going to help you get your roots deeper in the Lord. A great spiritual practice is memorizing scripture. And I wonder if you would join me in memorizing Psalm 1 as we study the psalm these next several weeks, that you would join me, maybe just one verse a week, verse one, then two, three, four, five, and six, one a week. And after six weeks, we'll have Psalm one memorized, this beautiful psalm that talks about the blessed person, that talks about the person who delights in the law of the Lord and meditates on God's law day and night. This, this man and woman who is like a tree planted by the streams of water, that yields its fruit in season, its leaf does not wither, and all that he does, he prospers. Will you memorize this entire psalm with me as a spiritual practice? You know, Psalm 1, 1 warns against following the ways of the wicked, the sinners, the scoffers. It tells us that the happy person refuses to be shaped by the counsel of the culture, which tells you that you need more stuff in order to be happy. The blessed person, though, knows you can't find security in things that are temporary. The righteous of God choose a path of faithfulness that stands the test of time. And then Psalm 1 verse 6 sums it up in this way. It says, For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Friends, don't choose the perishing path. Choose the way of life. Delight yourself in him. You see, Christ came not to make your behavior good, not to make a legalist out of you. He died in your place to actually make you good. He takes your bad resume and he replaces it with his perfect one. See, in Christ, I'm already loved. And Christ proved to me on the cross that I have eternal significance and without doing anything to earn it. That's why we can delight in the law of the Lord. In Christ, the law of the Lord is his overwhelming grace. Rest in that. So I must replace the false narratives in my mind and that tell me that I'm not lovable unless I strive to be good, unless I perform, unless I entertain, unless I'm smart, unless I'm beautiful. These narratives in my mind that say I'm not lovable unless I have the perfect family. See, Christ brought the good news that if we make him our delight, then we receive a security we cannot lose. We don't have to prove ourselves to, or to anyone anymore. You just need to delight in him, meditate on him, focus on his goodness, and bring all of the reality of all of the emotions we're having, all of the struggles we're having, and he says you can delight in me in the midst of the pain. So would you join me in this prayer? Jesus, help us to believe this word of yours, that we can delight in your word and find hope for this season. Lord, teach us through the Psalms this pathway to a life that is good, a life filled with hope. 
Lord, help us to refuse these other false voices that tells us that we need to find life in these false ways, that more of this or more of that. Oh, Lord, we only need more of your word in me. We just need to focus more on you. So, Lord, thank you for receiving me as I am with all of my confusion, all of my struggles. And also, Lord, help me to be someone that brings praise, that delights in you, that recognizes your true love and your presence. Oh, Lord, may my deep, deep roots go deeply into your word, deeply into your spirit. Would you grow me up to be a person that offers good things to others? Oh, Lord, I want to be that blessed person who delights in you. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. We have an opportunity right now to keep delighting in the Lord as we sing this next song. Would you join us in worship this good God who looks upon you with love right now? Let's sing together. Thank you so much for joining us this week. We hope you felt free to bring all of yourself to worship and to the light in the Lord today. I want to challenge you to do one more thing. I want you to challenge yourself to remind someone this week who they are in Christ. That if you have a mom or a grandma in your life or maybe someone who played a mentor role in your life, would you tell them, remind them how they're a gift to you? Maybe how they provided shade for you at some point in your past. Would you help remind them how God has used them to bless you in your life? That maybe how you have been blessed by their steadiness. You've been blessed by their fruit, blessed by their shade. You, see, you know, so many of us meditate on the wrong things. These voices of self-doubt, these voices of self-judgment, instead of God's word that says you were wired for worship, you were made for joy, you were created to perfectly fill the purposes of God that he intends in your life. 
So I want you to encourage people to meditate on the truth of who they are, God's beloved children. Remind someone that their life matters this week. And don't forget to remind yourself that you matter because of a God who looks upon you with love. And now the benediction from Psalm 19 verse 4. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And so delight in the reality of God's love. Soak up the cleansing waters of the Spirit. Rejoice in the fact that Jesus is coming back for his own. And until he comes again, stay rooted in him. Let your roots go deep and may your fruit be sweet. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Spirit, all God's people said, Amen. God bless you and we'll see you next week.